Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. This is webinar number 183, and we're, I know, isn't it amazing? Um, Laura, I have to look back because you were back in the teens, I think, when we first started. Um, and I think, is this your third or fourth webinar? This is the fourth. Fourth, yeah. So um, it's really great to have you back. Um, just remember, you can find this in all the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel and subscribe. And that way, I don't always get the videos up straight away. Like um, if the webinar is in the evening, it might take me a day or so if I have something else going on the next day. So if you subscribe, you'll get a notification every time we put up another webinar. And that way, you don't have to worry about, did I miss it? All right. Today, my guest is Laura Plunkett, a dear friend from um, that I've met in Martha's Vineyard, although she has a home off the vineyard as well. Um, and welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for joining me today. Love being here. I'm excited to get going. This is good. It's a great right. topic to be talking about. So Laura, uh, before we dive into the topic, for people who may not have seen your previous webinars, can you just give them a kind of a little brief bio and kind of how you got here? Yeah, and it will tie into our topic uh, because I, so I have been around horses and riding all my life. And I found out I was intuitive around the time that I was 35. But I have also been an incredible skeptic about animal communicators, which is now what I am. <laughs> um, and then many of your viewers will relate to this. It, when you're injured and you can't be with horses, it's excruciating. And I had a back injury bad enough that I thought I was gonna to have to give up riding, although now I'm riding again. And at that point, a friend of mine said, you've got to learn how to use your intuitive skills of being able to open up and access information we can't necessarily see or hear with our five senses. And you gotta apply it to horses. To which I said, I'm not gonna be one of those people. I, I can't believe just my whole attitude about it was terrible, really, truly. But, um, you know, through the pressure, I took a couple of classes. And um, actually, before that, she came over with a photograph of a horse. And she said, I'm telling you right now, just see what you get from this photograph. And the first image I saw, I could, she showed me the horse and I said, I feel like he's in a postage stamp. I see him in this tiny, tiny, tiny space. And like he feels all wedged in. And she said, well, he's on stall wrist, rest for a suspensory issue. And that was what led me to go to um, a weekend being taught how to do it and then a, a long online class and to finally uh, get comfortable with this whole notion that yes, we have this skill and that if you practice it and you don't naysay it, you can actually do a little Dr. Doolittle you know? And um, when I was done, she said, you know, how are you feeling? What's going on? Do you feel confident? I said, I don't like, I have no idea. So she dragged me to a place in New Hampshire where her friend owned a barn. And I went up and I talked to two of the horses and the owner, lo and behold, this is going to tie into our aid and comfort at the end of life topic because the first horse I talked to was a mare that the owner had had since she was a baby. And I knew nothing. I look at her, I do my connection, which we can talk about a little bit because the skill is easy and accessible to people. I do it in front of the stall. I'm nervous. I can't even say how nervous. It felt stupid. And then the turns out the horse was maybe late twenties, um, had aches and pains all over. I'm just looking at her in a stall and I talked to her for a while about the lovely life she had had and how happy she was, but she started to tell me that she really was ready to go. And the owner told me that in her heart, she knew it was the time, but at the same time, every time this horse would um, roll in the sun, every time the horse would make a lovely like snorting noise, um, when they'd be out playing and all of a sudden the horse would slowly like trot behind the other horses. She just would talk herself into, I can't take these moments away from the horse. So in saying that, the owner said to me, I wish I had a clear sign. This is incredibly painful. I don't know what to do. And I heard in my head, just tell her not to worry. I will walk up to her and put her head in my hands, my head in her arms. 
And so that was the first story. And I'll jump ahead to say that she called me the next day. And for the first time in her life with this horse, the horse approached her and laid her heavy head, makes me cry right in the woman's arms. And that gave her the comfort to say, okay, you know, she's hurting all over and this gave her time. So she wrote me a beautiful note about that. Um, and the second horse I talked to, we're still in the barn aisle and I go up to a horse that looked, you know, that when black horses get the white in their face because they're so old and they get hollows around their temples. And he, he just didn't have a lot of uh, muscle tone, but he was big. And he was sort of good doing this. He was shifting, shifting in the stall. And so I went over to him and I realized sort of my body hurt. And um, we stood in front and I made my connection again. And all I could see was this beautiful black shiny horse, all muscle. I'm in an indoor arena and the rider is in a black habit, you know, the whole black with the, with the top hat. And I look at the woman, you have to understand, I am shaking because I'm thinking, this is stupid. This has nothing to do with anything. But thankfully, I wasn't charging her. She was willing to sort of take what she got. And I explained it. And she said, oh, yes, he competed in dressage in Madison Square Garden. And his rider was this guy. And that was the start. So when you ask me sort of what's my background, that that's the start of how I started to say, you know what, I can't let this go. I've got to see where this can lead. And the end to that story is that he, because that was so convincing to her and some other details he told me, then he said to me, look, I, 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 I can't even get outside to be turned out. I am and was an athlete and I don't want to keep going if I can't be useful and be an athlete. And please, would you let me be done? And so the hard part about that first visit is I talked to two horses, but the owner then also said to me, yes, it's true. He has not, he can't, in all winter, he hasn't been able, because the minute we get outside, he's very shaky on his feet. We can't do the ice. We can't do anything. And um, so she made her peace with that also. So that's so fascinating that the first two horses that you really communicated with were horses that were at end of life. Um, and I wanted to say to everyone watching that I set this up with you. I, I had written to you and said, what about one on end of life? And you had said to me that you were already thinking about that topic. And I wanna say right away, you, the one you did with Joyce Harmon on end of life, I hope that everybody will watch that. I was so moved by it. And I would say that about so, so many of your webinars, but. The one particularly with Joyce helped me personally to talk about this topic and from a vet's point of view was fabulous, was amazing. I wrote to her after, mm -hmm. but um, I wrote to you to ask to do this partially because I lost Bodhi, my cat, in mm -hmm. February. And so I wanted to say up front to everybody that some of the stuff we'll be talking about, it seems sort of like, oh, and she put her head in her hands and the woman then put the let the horse um, pass. But the pain of losing these animals, I don't wanna act like this isn't incredibly um, painful and difficult to make these decisions. And having lost my cat and having witnessed how sort of, um, well, I'll just say that I didn't let myself grieve fully enough. This is of all the animals I've ever owned, my cat Bodhi was like, I can't even explain what that relationship was like. and. I'm sure you know about that. And I actually have a quote I was going to read uh, um, from someone else who wrote about what that potential relationship can be like with any of our animals. But the closest I felt, I didn't really give myself the chance to fall apart and basically stop functioning. And I, like my shoulder will not move. I put it all in my body. So um, I'm, I'm the cautionary tale of now having to go back and really start saying out loud, I, I like, this is incredibly painful. You know, I, we're a society where grief isn't something that is, it's very difficult. Um, you know, the, there's a whole thought, although COVID has changed things dramatically, I think, but, you know, prior to COVID, there was the keep them alive at all costs, um, go to extraordinary measures. Um, and there was a an article that was written, and actually I ran into a person right when I was reading this article about how with people, 
you know, when you, when say someone has cancer and we try to do everything we can to keep them alive and they die, the problem is we've been so busy trying to keep them alive that we haven't gone through the process of coming to the terms of their being gone yeah. and going through that grieving process. And it leaves people in severe depression, often destitute because they put all their money into trying to save someone. And so, you know, that this is, I could, I can so see when I was sitting next to this person in a car and she was driving me and I can't even tell you where we were, but I will never forget the conversation with her because she had just lived that experience. Yeah. And she was still in depression and she lost her job and she lost her, she, you know, she lost so many things because we struggle with the concept of death. We, we, we don't really uh, socially accept grieving. Yeah. Um, and so it, it makes it hard. And with animals, they're never going to live as long as us unless we get a parrot. And they see it so differently. Yes. That's one of the things I can share that the horses have been so beautifully eloquent about their lack of fear. They can feel the fear we have. They can feel that we're hanging on, but they're not afraid. Yeah. Um, and having um, lost several animals and not always in the best of circumstances. Um, I, I've, I've used animal communicators for quite a number of those passings and it's always fascinated me how their concern is usually about something else. <laughs> in other words, not really concerned. Andy died of botulism and I didn't tell that story with, with Dr. Herman. Um, and when we tried to talk to him, he was incredibly confused because he had botulism. Um, um, but that, you know, that was a different circumstance where there was a, uh, an acute um, issue. Um, but anyway, okay, so. All right. So, um, and yes, I just want to say to everybody, I see Jinx is out there, which makes me so happy. Um, but please feel free to chime in because I, I do think it's a tender topic and it, it's good it's good to be able to interact about these things. But my what I wanted to do, I put together some different stories that are ways to talk about this whole decision and how both the horse can feel more comfortable or the animal in general, and then how we can feel more comfortable as this time comes, whether it's an emergency or it's something that you can see on the horizon coming towards you. Um, but I also wanted to say, I know you said you've used animal communicators and that's something that I do, but there are also so many ways we can do it ourselves. And so I wanted to spend a little time talking about that first, if that's okay. Sure. Because the more that you, one of the things that gave me so much comfort, my cat had to go first to the vet and have surgery and then into a hospital where with COVID there was no chance I was gonna visit. But at least I knew how to make the connection with him at a distance and to let him know, okay, today you're just going in for a quick thing. Um, tomorrow you need to stay overnight. We're still with you. This is all to help you. And so I did want to say that although we're taught in this culture that that's not something in our own skill set, that the steps are really easy. And so there's a, there's a couple things. One is um, I am going to do, I'm doing a class once a month. It's $15 and we are gonna practice because the hardest thing is to practice on your own animals. Yes, <laughs> and absolutely. It's impossible. So um, I am gonna do this where you're gonna be able, people will practice and then I'll talk to those animals in front of, so they'll get to sort of see, did I get anything of value as I then kind of download what the, what the animal's going through. That's one thing. Another thing is I have a mini course because the classes I took were expensive. The weekend I went was expensive and I, it's not that complicated. So I have this mini course on my website that's, you know, you could literally in 13 minutes, one of them is 14. It just says exercises and you can just do it. And even barring that, um, I don't, they probably find things online that will show you. Um, your what all Somebody says your mini course is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say that, that the one thing I will say is I get a lot of emails that it's working, that they can do it, that there are concrete examples. Um, and that same thing with the classes. And that is quick. It's like, all you need to be done is shown the steps. But, but I think what I wanted to say overall is that 
Sharon Wilsey says it best, that whole thing of zero. And that in the midst, if your horse is uncomfortable and you can find a way to get yourself to a quiet place without your own assumptions, animals, including our horses, have such a way of letting us know how they are. And oftentimes when someone does hire me, they'll say, I knew it. You can hear them saying, uh-huh, I knew it. And that's because we have that inside ourselves. It helps. I'm not saying it doesn't help to have the bells and whistles that then make you really confident. But if you can build the skill, then when you get to a time like this, you'll be able to say to the horse, okay, how's your body feeling? And you can feel it in your own body. So does that so, make sense? Yeah. And you know, I think that because we can verbalize so much with so much detail, we tend to sort of let the other senses slide. Um, but it doesn't mean they're not there. Yes. You know, like any skill, it requires practice. Like you didn't learn to write, do writing without practice. You had to practice your writing. And as you practice your writing, you got better. And then when you learned a keyboard, you got worse. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. I practiced a different skill, right? But, you, you know, it in order to get good at something, it does take practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that almost everyone has had an experience at some point in their life where there was something inexplicable on a, a, a sort of an analytical level on a, you know, what we might consider hard fact level, but that panned out, that was really true. And um, it's having the faith in ourselves that it's possible. Um, I think that that's a piece that so many people, I see that in their riding actually, and they'll do something and they'll, is that right? And they doubt. That's right. And even if you call it a sixth sense, if we're going to trust what we see and you say, oh, he's limping, also trust how you feel around him. Right. Right. Do you get more anxious whenever you're standing or in the barn, you know, then your horse might be anxious. So, um, so that was one thing. And then, um, I'm wondering, let me just say one more thing about that, that the reason I bring that up as such an important skill is that for, your, for people's comfort and for their animals' comfort, there's, when I do talk to animals, they have so many questions. What's happening now? Why do I need to get in the trailer? Um, who is this person that's coming to treat me? Wh you know, where, where do you want me to go? What's happening? Why do I have this pain? Um, and, and all of those things, if you can put a picture of it in your mind or some kind of representation and learn to send it, you'll literally see that horse or that other animal lick and chew, relax, breathe differently. You know, you can see the instant gratification of it. And then the other thing is that you're going to have so many questions at this time when your horse is uncomfortable and to be able to ask an open-ended question, how are you? And then to trust a little bit of what you get. I know I'm repeating myself, but it, it comes back so many times that once someone has called me and we've had the conversation, they say, I feel so much better. And meanwhile, my horse is acting so much better. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden they will stand for the vet. All of a sudden they are getting on the trail or whatever it is you need them to do because they know what you're trying to achieve. Um, I wanted to, I did say I have some stories. I thought I might talk about Pilgrim at Misty Meadows, which is a therapeutic riding center up in Martha's Vineyard. And Pilgrim um, is a horse that was nearing 40 uh, oh. before his passing. And I met him several years ago. And so when I met him, uh, the executive director asked me to talk to him and check in with him. And he said to me, he was ready to go, that he had had a long, beautiful life. He was probably mid 37 then, something like that. He was um, having pain. He was pretty isolated. He was with some other horses, but nobody was riding him at the time. And he felt loved, cared for, and didn't want to do it anymore. And he said, it was very long. It was very beautiful. He said, you all think that longevity is the best thing. Uh, horses don't care how, they're not worried about how old they are, um, but they do really care about pain. And if they're in pain, that makes it not worth it. If they can't be useful, that sometimes makes it not worth it. I'm not saying that, I'm trying to show you some generalized mm -hmm. comments that horses make, um, but generally if they can't be athletic and they were athletes before, they're sort of like, what's the point? 
um, if they can't enjoy their food, if, they, if they're having to be in pain because the banamine is making them sick, those kind of things, they, they, they'll say to me, I'm sort of done. Like, what does my owner need to know? Because I'd like to go. They're just matter of fact. Um, but Pilgrim was in a situation where all everybody loved him there. And he was sort of the icon. And his owner and uh, Sarah, who you know, you know, were sort of like, well, is there anything we can do to make it better instead? And it was beautiful because I could feel him switch in my head, like, hmm. And he said, well, if at night I can, uh, if, if I can be moved closer to all the action, so there's more to watch, if um, you will, are willing to keep my legs warm because he had arthritis. And this is a common thing I will say for a lot of horses that are older. You put a blanket on them and you think they're okay, but if they have arthritis in the lower parts of their legs, they will show me it is incredibly difficult to get through the winter, mm -hmm. that they spend a lot of nights in that stall or out and in a lot of pain and it makes sleep hard. And he was in that situation. So of course I'm, I'm with Sarah and she's saying, sure, like, we can put, we can wrap his legs and um, we can put him somewhere different. And then I'm trying to think he had all these little snacks. He wanted the kids to walk him, all this stuff. Well, listen, he would, from then on, they instituted the things that he wanted changed. And um, it was just this past month that he had breakfast was sitting in the sun and then he laid down and died on his own terms. Hmm. So that's more the comfort and aid part that I'm talking yeah. about. And you know, it's um, it, it, it's not always possible to let animals go on their own terms. That's, um, you know, I know that there's, there's those two sides of when do I assist and when do the, when can I let them go on their own? And it's, not something you can plan ahead of time, I don't think. I think it's something you have to take in the moment, case by case. Yeah, yeah. And the, you know, one thing we should talk about is just that human side to consider what can you do so that whether it's an accident, whether it's immediate and an emergency or whether it's something chronic, you can have the best experience. And, you know, we've talked about, okay, build your skill. <laughs> That's one thing. But um, I wrote down a few notes you know, it's such a hugely amount emotional time. It's hard to be rational. I know that with my own cats, hospital bills, and you mentioned it too. You're just sort of thrown into the pain of it and you end up saying yes to a cat skin, yes to this, yes to that. Um, which I'm, I'm not saying I regret, but you kind of, the more that you know what you can and can't do ahead of time mm -hmm. and have that thought through, the better. Yeah, um, because that bills now are as big as human bills. I mean- Yes, yes, you, they are. You can wind up uh spending a lot of money and then finding yourself in a very difficult pos position in addition to losing your animal i also put down you know something that you and joyce talked about so beautifully who and which animals do you want to be there if you have the choice like if you have the time um joyce talked about pasture mates for her horse and i know that when pilgrim passed uh sarah left let the horse he was the horses he was turned out with um, spend time. And um, I think that's really important to consider. A very big one is having an understand, understanding and rapport with your vet. Oh, wow, it's huge. It's huge that your vet knows what your plan is, what your wishes are, uh, what you, how you consider your best ending to be, you know, those kind of things. And the other thing I will say, is that when I am talking to animals, oftentimes they have a preferred vet. Oh. So I'll be talking to a cat or a dog or a horse and, and the, uh, the cat will say, you know, just like literally put the picture of the vet they want. And I'll say, oh, do you have a, you know, more petite woman with a round face um, because he doesn't want the man or vice versa. So I think one thing to think about is, is your animal comfortable with the person that you're you've got currently, because I know we're all trying, but when it comes to the end, you really want someone you're both comfortable with. Does that make sense? Right. And it, sometimes it's not possible because they're on call or they're not on call. Um, um, but it, you know, one of the things I keep hearing from you is planning. Yeah. And that if we plan, if we have a plan and that, you know, this goes back to Rebecca Housted's webinars that we're all, if you have a plan, even if it's 
not the plan you wind up with, but you have a plan. It means you've thought these things through. Uh, um, and so, so it's not, the biggest problem is when, and believe me, I can attest to this, you know, when you're in that moment of drama, you're not able to make good plans. Um, and, you know, I talked about what happened with Fanny when she passed, but I didn't talk about Andy, whom um, the night before I hired somebody to come and groom him because I thought he didn't look right. For months, I thought he didn't look right in the field. And that was the intuitive side that I kept looking him in the field and Brad, I would make Brad drive me to the barn before we went to the airport and I would see him and I would be hysterical because I thought something was wrong. And that went on for three months. And then I hired somebody to groom him. And the next day I got on a plane and I had a stop. I think it was in Kansas City. And Joyce contacted me and said that he was colicking. And Brad went over and it was 106 degrees. And he walked Andy for hours in 106 degrees, but he wasn't colic. It was botulism and we didn't know it at the time. So I couldn't get, I had to go on to Colorado and couldn't get back until he had passed. Um, but when I got home and looked at him, he was perfect. His weight was excellent. His coat was excellent. His, everything was perfect, except he was dead. Um, and Joyce led the other horses. Um, in fact, I wasn't there. Brad and Joyce did that. And they brought them over. And Brad still to this day says that Andy passed his job on to Al. Um, yeah, Al waffled his ears. So, you know, that was like, a, a, I mean, it was so unexpected. And I was so fortunate to have people at home that could deal with it. And Joyce was working on him and the, another vet was brought in, but the, the, the intuition I had for months that something was wrong and yet botulism was instant, right? Two horses, Denny and Andy grazing side by side in the same field, no hay, summertime, one dies, one stays alive. Um, but that I'm intuition of there's something not right with this horse was for months. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see that we have in the chat, Sam McLean is saying that she actually has people fill out a form. Do you see that? No, I haven't read that yet. There, I just, yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to see that form. I think it's so smart. Oh, see. advanced directive for horses, similar to human one that helps think through the process before they are in the thick of it. That's an excellent idea. Um, and someone else says, I have a communicator when the cat went missing while I was out of town. They told me they didn't like the pet sitter and never, I never used him again. <laughs> Sam happy to share. Jinx is asking, um, do you hear them communicating in words or is it a feeling or pictures from them? Different uh, for different people. So for me, I get all of that now. Um, when I started, I mostly had pictures. I think the more you practice, the more the range gets big, but I have met people that only feel things. And I've met other people who say, whoa, in my head, in my mind's eye, it's like a movie. So it just, it really does depend. Some people feel it in their body. Some people feel it outside of them. So I would say it's it's varied. And I there's an exercise that I lead where I help people figure out where their spot is. So that's another thing. I uh, It's something, you, it's a little much to get into now, but it's good to know what your ability is. You know what I mean? Yep. Where your portal is, at least for starting. And then I think it's like any channel that you open, it just gets broader and you can get more info. And, and do you find different animals communicate in different ways? Oh, yeah. Or level, I should say, even level of conversation. Yes, yes. And one thing about animals that are in pain, which is sometimes what we're talking about here, is that, um, or anxious, you'll have, it's very important. How do I say this? Some horses there are harder to communicate with some animals. And you could say to yourself, I'm not getting anything. I can't do it. I, Laura probably could, but I can't. But no, it's that some animals need, I have to say, can you pay attention? I hear that you're in pain, but can you, can you, you know, really focus on me? Or if they're anxious, I'll say, calm down and let's just, can you get some information? So some of the thing, just like with us, it's hard for us to communicate. Um, to meditate, if you're all wound up, sometimes horses have that same problem. Uh, so there's just ways around it. Let me just see. Oh, this is another one, Wendy, where sometimes I have clients that have some regrets. And I would just say that's such a personal tender thing. Oftentimes, no matter what they'll say about, 
I did this, I did that. The horse is saying, I wasn't worried about that. That's fine. I understand. You know, I left you out in the backyard with nobody for a year. And the horse is saying, yeah, but it was a break. It's okay. I knew what you were going through. I could tell what was going on. There's so much forgiveness. There's so much love coming from these animals. Um, but if you do have any regrets, I would say make amends, like try to figure out what in your own heart would even that equation, give them extra treats, do what you need. Because the worst thing is to have your animal pass and not feel like you've made that piece. So that's another just to think about. Um, and then well, just well, somebody in, res in response to that, somebody saying, I still feel guilty about hanging on too long. I know my horse forgives me, but it's tough. It is tough. I mean, I could cry from that. It's tough, right? And, and I, and we don't know what's too long, but, and, and, you know, she says that I know she's not doing extra damage to herself, but I don't know that anyone can go through this kind of a decision unless it's a true accident where it's not up to you and not relive it and question it and wonder. I think that's all part of it. I think we're so much harder on ourselves because we can think about the past and the future, whereas the horses, they, they have memory, but they live so much more in the present that the memory, as long as it's not a trauma, is just the memory. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking about any general points of view that I've heard consistently from horses. So I'll run through them, even though maybe some of them we've talked about, but it is very different than humans. I talked about, you know, they're not, eat, they don't need to avoid death. Um, they're not, they, they, one of the typical things would be, you know, I'll hear, well, I've seen a lot of horses come and go. When you think about all the relationships horses have to give up over the course of their life, we move them around, we move the pasture mates, they see dogs come and go, they have different owners there. And then, um, they are out in nature in ways that we aren't. So they see the passing of animals. They know that animals in nature are hurt and they die. And so I get a lot of pictures of uh, them being very aware of the different horses in their life that have died and that it's okay. Um, I'm used to life and death and goodbyes as well as hellos is a quote that I wrote down that uh, I remember a horse telling me. Again, the usefulness, whether they can be useful, even some horses will say, well, if she wants me to stay, I want the blonde little girl from next door to come over and visit me every day. And the, and the owner will say, there is a blonde girl next door and she does want to visit, you know, those kind of things. There is, there is that, that to them is useful. The, they know that if you would just let them, a, a really big thing is why can't I just help an anxious person? Like, why don't you find someone to come stand with me that's anxious and I'll help them feel better. You know, some of these master horses that we have that, that aren't rideable anymore, but they just wanna be the, the love of someone's life. So that helps them keep going a lot. Um, season of year in my neck of the woods, New England comes up over and over because the cold for an older horse. They don't wanna, I, oftentimes they'll say, happy through the summer, don't wanna do another winter. Yeah. Um, and then this is such a beautiful thing, their willingness to give a sign. And I wrote down my four most frequent signs that horses talk about. Um, we talked about putting a horse will put their head in your hands or in some way surrender and just rest on you, on your shoulder, or on your arms. Um, they'll stop engaging. So horse will say, she'll know when I just don't really respond to her anymore. Um, another one is to stop drinking or eating. And I have had horses say, you'll know I'm done when I lay down and I just don't want to get up again. Just not going to get up. So I'd say those are frequent, but that one thing we forget to do is just walk into the barn if you're having this question and just say to your horse, open your heart, open your mind, get quiet and just say, the horse's name and say, please give me a sign. I need a sign I'm going to recognize. And that's a very simple way to then just be open, start to notice what your horse showing you. And hopefully it'll be something where you'll say, okay, that's so out of character that now I'm convinced. So we have someone saying that I always let my living dog see the one who has passed. So we realized what has happened. I didn't do that once. And my dog kept looking for his friend. Yeah. Again, I, recently a friend of mine that 
one of her dogs passed and the other one's still looking. So, um, someone else is saying, in most cases, I have not regret, I have regretted not doing it soon enough. It's so hard for us to say goodbye. I agree, the vet and their relationship with us both is so important. Yeah. And also if you and the vet trust each other, hopefully the, your veterinarian would be able to help you see what you might be missing because we're so vulnerable just because we love these animals so much to maybe not letting ourselves see exactly what they're going through. But you hopefully are saying, listen, if you ever get the feeling that this horse is in too much pain, you'll tell me, right? Because some veterinarians feel like they're just supposed to go with your wishes and so they don't mention that as a, as a way forward, so yeah. Um, I, ha I can tell you another story. Yeah. Um, I, in getting ready for this webinar, I called a client, Katie Webster. I'm not sure if you know Katie, she's wonderful. But Katie and I have, um, I have had the privilege of talking to her twice about horses that needed to be put down. And such a weird word, put down. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a great word for it. But um, so I called her and I just said, I'm doing this webinar with Wendy. What do you, what do you think I should say? What's important for people to know? You've just been through it twice. So, you know, she wrote me this beautiful, beautiful letter about what it all meant to her. Um, but it helps me because I have the details here that, Do so Doc is a Clydesdale. He was 16 years old and he started having unusual moodiness. And then there were other things that she would notice less enthusiasm for his food, um, fatigue. He was irritable with other horses and she had a feeling something was wrong, but you know, he looked good, the vitals were good. So, but she just kept thinking, I don't think he wants to do this anymore. So she called me and I got quiet on my mind and I looked at the picture of him, he's beautiful. I have a photo I could, maybe I could share. Can I share? Yes. Um, whoops, it says I, yeah, you're gonna let me? Yeah, I made you co-host. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, Sorry guys. It's okay. Right here. There we go. Can you see it? Uh, have you oh. hit your screen yet? Sorry. It's coming. Oh yeah, there he is. Okay. So you just see, he's just spectacular, right? And this I think is such a poignant moment because when your horse looks like that, how could you possibly think he's near the end? But she just had a feeling she trusted herself. She called me. And so what he said to me is he had two things going on. He said, I have Lyme and I also, something's wrong with my heart and I just am not, I'm exhausted all the time. I have pain in my heart and something's wrong. It's really weak. The muscles are weak. And so he said, if you can fix those things, then I want to stay. But if you can't, what point is there in me feeling exhausted all the time and having this real ache right here? And I hope Katie that I'm explaining it correctly. But what happened was, um, yes, he tested positive to Lyme. They treated him for Lyme. But when she got into the conversation with her vet about his heart, he had been on steroids for a uh, skin condition for, for decades, I think. Well, he's 16, but for most of his life. And it had, the vet said that, that one of the long-term things is it weakens the muscles of your heart. And so that wasn't reversed. So he, there's some things got better with the Lyme treatment, but there was nothing they could do for his heart. And so she had me talk to him one more time once the Lyme had, had um, passed, but you know, he said he was very clear with her and he just, he showed me where in the pasture he wanted to be buried, under what tree. And he had all the details of which vet. And he just said, please, I, I don't wanna live like this. And that was something we went through together. And um, it, I will say that she sort of knew even though everything looked the opposite and that I think she feels really at peace. She wrote to me that, um, how did she say it? it was so pretty. In the end, he said he was ready to go and even indicated where he would like to be buried. It was hard to hear, but knowing he was at peace with dying allowed me to be at peace with it as well. I made the arrangements and he is now buried on my farm. I have had to say goodbye to quite a few horses over the last 20 plus years, and it is always emotionally traumatic. For me, no matter how hard you have tried, 
when you lose in the end and have to let them go, there is a scent of guilt, of failure, along with that sense of loss and grief. This time, still a sense of loss, but because you allowed me to hear directly from him in a manner of speaking to get his permission, it was so much easier for me to know they have a different view of death than we do, that they are comfortable with it was a huge relief to me. I was actually fulfilling my promise to him to give him a peaceful end when he was ready for it. It's really lovely. So um, does anyone have an animal that they're, that they're uh, dealing with right now that is close to end of life or that has some questions about how, um, oh, Sam sent the, sent the uh, link to the advanced directive, by the way. I'm not sure we'll have to, you might have to copy paste it to get it out of there, uh, out of the chat. Um, All right, I can, uh, what I do, what I can do, Sam, if you're okay with the ideas, I can stick that up in the description on the YouTube channel when I post the webinar. Um, great, okay, so that's what I'll do. I'll stick it up in there. Um, and so, that, that story, Laura, has kind of put everybody in a pause here. I know, I know. Just take it in. I think we all, you know, you get to a certain point, you've all had experiences and this topic takes time to think of, think through and feel through. But I think that that's so much the, um, you know, Jinx said it too, that we don't, we feel guilty or that we haven't done enough or that uh, we should have done it sooner. There's, there's um, all these shoulda, woulda, couldas right? All these things that if only, um, if I'd acted soon enough, if I knew what that was going to be like, if I knew that that was going to cause that, we, we seem to um, want to kind of get into that space of where, uh, I hate, for lack of a better word, want to blame ourselves yeah. for these situations. But I, you know, horses don't see it that way, do they? They don't, they honestly, you know, I have to say this too, that horses very often tell me that the specific reason they are in their owner's life. Really? Yes. And I, and I, I, I think that's important to mention. Yeah. Because it takes the pressure off of each of us. In some way, they act as if they chose us. So they'll say to me, oh, I'm in her life because I'm calm and she's anxious. And every time she gets um, anxious, like I'm her safe harbor, right? Or um, I'm in her life because she needed that, you know, that um, it's really important for me that she gets to have the adventures that she wasn't otherwise going to have. And so we're on to upper level dressage or we're jumping. She's, she's going beyond what she ever thought she could do. Um, I'm in her life because uh, she needed unconditional love and it makes owners cry, you know, and it's specific, but I think it also can show us that, you know, they chose us too, and yeah. our good enough is good enough. We aren't supposed to be perfect. They didn't come in because they wanted a perfect owner. They came in to be useful, to help, to care, to love, um, to learn. Uh, sort of just like we did. That's so fascinating. Um, someone's asking, um, do you feel that a horse's spirit will show itself again in another body for a second chance at peace upon passing? You know, I think, I mean, that they come back to their owners. Can you read it again? Um, hang on. Maybe I can. I let me flip it that. off, but I'll pull it back. Uh, do you feel that a horse's spirit will show itself again in another body for a second chance? I do. I know that's, you know, we're trying to stay away from the complete woo-woo of what this could be. I, I have a quote at the end. I have to read that. The, okay. Save it till the end. So, um, Jinx. Um, no, but wait, but what the, the, 
for those of us who it isn't doesn't go against i'll just speak for myself i had an extremely vivid dream when i got a new kitten where i watched my old cat turn into the kitten wow in my dream and the old cat was saying here's your gift so yes, I could be making that up, but I think that one thing that happened in my life and because my second cat had so many mannerisms like the first, I'm not saying they were the same cat. That sounds a little, but there was some continuity of what animal I was having in my life. Okay. Jinx. All right. Jinx. Um, so Jinx says my burrow Jerome, who Laura has communicated with in the past is elderly and he seems very stiff and ouchy and Joyce is treating him for Lyme. Do you have any thoughts or guidance? He's cool. Jerome, <laughs> have you met him? Uh, I've seen him. He's so the best. He's just, just an amazing being. And I think if I remember correctly from Jinx that he sort of runs the roost too, you know, even though he's the smallest. Um, but Jinx, I would say do not underestimate the pain that these older animals are in. And yeah, he thinks he does, she says. One of the things I would say is that oftentimes owners don't want to give um, pain medicine because, you know, you hear, oh, it's going to ruin their kidneys. It's going to, but when you have a horse that's older and I am not a vet, um, but oftentimes I would say if you, if you decide that a, at a really, you, you just want to make sure that the pain is mitigated. Um, yeah. Horses don't do pain very well. They don't, <laughs> they don't. And I trust Joyce and I trust Jinx. And I think that, though, you know, you're both intuitive and you both feel and you both want what's best. And so I'm sure, um, but what I would do is learn the body scan, Jinx, because if you could stand there and take stock of how your own body feels and then make a connection with Jerome and just let him flood you with how he feels. And honestly, this is not something, then you just ask for him to back it out and it goes away. I've never been adversely affected by doing it, but you will really, yeah, she's saying Prevacox. It doesn't matter what, but it's just the um, something to get rid of the pain. So anyway, if you can open yourself to what he's really going through and make sure that his pain levels aren't overly high, um, that's what I would say about Jerome because he he's such a wonderful being and also that it's important to say look at if you don't want to do this anymore please give me a sign right so you could say to him if you walk up to me and you put your head in my arms and you show him that picture like if you don't want if you if it's your time and you want help with that then you literally need to walk over to me and do this thing and you show it in your head like a movie um I'm not exaggerating this works it works and, um, but not if he normally does that, pick something that he doesn't normally do with you. Right. So is that helpful, Jinx? Well, and I think what you're saying is we, we, we need them, we need to give ourselves permission to let them go. And when they can give us a sign, then we can give ourselves permission to let them go. And I think that that's actually the bigger problem is um, in all the animals that I've had pass, it wasn't the passing that there was the problem. It was me. <laughs> mm, interesting. Can you say more about that though? What do you mean? Yeah. Well, when Fanny died on the side of the road, you know, I mean, she fell out of the trailer at an intersection when I was taking her to the hospital because she had bacterial enteritis and we literally took ropes and heaved her off the road because she was in the road and she was dying. And when I had an animal communicator talk to her, the first thing she said was, how's it going with your landlord? Because I had had some problems with my landlord. And so then she said, you know, well, I was thinking about it. I was considering it. And I've been thinking about this for a while, but her death was traumatic. I mean, it was traumatic for me. It was traumatic for everybody that was there because the whole bunch of people stopped. But for her, it was, oh, I was thinking about this for a while, you know, so um, and then Andy, of course, that was a trauma because I wasn't even home and everybody else was dealing with the source that they couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, but, I, and I did use an animal communicator and I don't have as clear a memory of that as I do with um, Fanny, but what I, what I know every time I've had an animal communicator talk to an animal of mine that's passed, I am flooded with a sense of relief. 
Yeah. Um, when my dog was traumatically killed, he was, I was at work. He was 4th of July. He was outside. He got spooked by fireworks and ran across the road and got hit and killed. And again, it was, you know, for him, it wasn't traumatic. For me, it was horrendous. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I find that time and time again is they're like, well, oh, oh, well, you know, and we're left with all this. I've had, a, you know, um, so yeah. I, their, their whole concept, from my opinion, from my experience with all the animals that I've had lost, um, we have such a different perspective. We do. Yeah. And to, oh, yeah. So, so I'll read this. Okay. Um, uh, so somebody said, after many years in the army and getting close to retirement, I finally fulfilled my dream of getting a horse, Calypso. I had to put her down after an accident in the field back in 2012, and I was still devastated over her loss. Last year I lost, uh, in October, I lost my Mai in October after caring for her for seven years. Then in November, 2020, six days after Lizzie's my dog's 13th birthday, I lost her in an undetected mass. She was my best, best friend, and I still grieve for her every day. Today is, today is my dog, English Bull Terrier, Stella's 13th birthday, and I worry every day that it will be the, the day. She shows signs of grief since losing Lizzie, and I see her losing her spark, but when I get outside with her, I see her trying to be young again. Both my dogs were together since they were only three months old, and I am constantly beside myself with worry for not only Stella, but the mayor who is now 18. See, this is just what it's like, right? If we admit it, it's hard. You've got all these memories, Melody, and, you know, and fear. Because once you realize you can lose an animal, then you've got to be willing to love and lose again. Because they don't outlive us for the most part. And so by the time we're the ages that we are, you've had a lot of animals and you've had to go through a ton of grief. And then the question is, you know, what do I do with my current animals? But I would say... Um, that the, I have a couple of suggestions for your animals that are grieving, the lost animals. One is the heart hug. And Wendy, we've, you know, we, I think we've talked about it and you've done it and, um, and know about it, but it is that opportunity to help move energy through your animal's heart. And if they'll let you, like for a horse, you can put your well, for any animal, you put your you can put your right hand on over the withers or between the shoulder blades, and then the left hand where the heart is, um, or vice versa. Does it? I wait to see a pattern in my head, but you'll maybe get a feeling about which hold is better. But to also open your own heart, it helps our animals so much if we let them understand the grief that we're feeling because you're feeling grief too. And so if you go stand next to a horse. I had this experience on Martha's Vineyard, a friend of mine. Um, so she had a gelding and a mare. I rode the mare, she rode the gelding. The mare died and the gelding just wasn't recovering and she called me. And I was so sad about losing the mare. And I walked up like, hey, how are you doing? Nothing's wrong. And he didn't really want anything to do with me. He turned his back to me and I caught it. And I just said, oh, right. I just let my heart open and I let all the grief, I just, admitted like being back at the barn was so hard because she wasn't there I felt my grief I walked up to him and said you know can I hug you because I'm so sad and he turned right to me and I just slipped my hands like that and we stayed there for a long time with my heart open and sad and his heart open and sad and she saw an improvement you know from after I left that of course it helped me too because you're connecting with this big beautiful animal's energy um, and I was able to move some of my grief and get more to gratitude for the time I had had with her. But um, that's one thing that I would say is to try to have as much integrity or authenticity with what you're really feeling rather than trying to be strong for your animals. And then also, if you can let them know, either verbally talk out loud, because some animals will understand that or show you in your mind in pictures, you know, what happened? For, for these animals, some of them, the, the animal went off to the vet and they never saw them again. So if you can say, I'm so sorry, but the animal, there was nothing we could do. We couldn't save him or her. You'll start to see in the same way we're used to, the licking and chewing, the breathing better, the starting to eat again, the, the willingness to lay down and take a nap. You know, you can see that whatever message you gave is bringing some relief. 
So I hope that- and, um, Well, and I wanna add one other piece to that because if we don't, if we don't process our grief, we recreate it. And there's research now, um, there's a, a book called Walking with, Walking with the Tiger by uh, Peter Levin, who works with, talks about PTSD and trauma and how we recreate yeah. patterns. And if so if you, um, if you don't go through that process of grieving and working through the emotions, the, the fear, the, the, not the fear, but the concern is that you do recreate it with the animals you have now. So it's really important to process it. All right, well, Anything we haven't touched on, do you think, about this topic? No, but you said you had something you wanted to read. I do, I do. So the first thing is, so I'm going to read from Giselle Bunchen's book. She's a model and also a, she's Tom Brady's wife. Um, oh, okay. But she is an environmentalist. And if you have not watched the movie Kiss the Ground, highly recommend it because it's one of the most hopeful, it's actually grounded in science and makes you hopeful about climate change. But anyway, the first thing I wanna say is that she, she wrote this and it helped me grieve my cat when I realized she would say this in front of the world, but she said, um, here it is. It may sound crazy to say, but that one small dog could be a guardian angel a best friend, a protector, a defender, and a constant source of joy and happiness in my life, but it's true. And this is, she said, even more than people. Vita was the most loving, sweetest, smartest, funniest, most courageous little being I have ever known. Not a day went by when she didn't make me feel special and happy and loved. I know Vita can hear me when I tell her over and over again, thank you, mommy will always love you. And I wonder what that just even did for her to be able to say and declare, you know, this dog was that important to me. And then I want to read one other thing she had in this book. And don't I just I pulled this out because I was reading it when I when I realized we were going to be doing this together. Um, it's a story about a frog. OK, it's, it's like a page. Um, someone once told me a story about a frog and a well. It's an old story and maybe you've heard it before, but here it goes. Once there was a frog who lived at the bottom of a well. He spent most of his time in the water and the shadows and from his vantage point, the world seemed familiar and complete and perfect. I know everything there is to know about everything, the frog thought. I can see every star and comet and constellation. I can tell the difference between day and night, dusk and dawn. I know every cloud, every star and every passing bird. I know everything there is to know about life. One day the frog got curious, so he decided to take a leap of faith to check if there was anything beyond the well. When he landed outside, he could not believe the whole new world around him. When he looked up at the sky, instead of seeing the small hole-shaped version of reality he'd known his entire life, he saw a huge, ever-changing and completely exhilarating world. There were more stars, comets, clouds, constellations, and birds than he knew existed. There was grass, trees, rocks, and an infinite horizon. He was suddenly aware of the smallness of his own body. And I just think it's a beautiful metaphor to letting ourselves open to all that we can open to. It's lovely. Well, thank you, Laura. This has been just a really terrific webinar and uh, so generous of you to share your experiences that you've had with verses with everyone here. Thanks so Pleasure. much. Pleasure is mine. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, tomorrow I'll be doing my Surefoot webinar at one o'clock. A little hard to follow this act. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll be so, No, let me just plug yours. Come <laughs> on. If you want to talk about comfort, let's just say one of the universal things that brings horses comfort, especially toward the end when they're achy, is your pads. 100%. Oh, awesome. It oh, is. Good. Pads, pads. I'm serious. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all later. Take care. Bye. Bye.